if this is actually going to work. Uh, I have to upgrade the laptop, the microphone, and is this? Oh yes, then. We're in business. <laughs> I wish I could. How's that? Okay. Um, my topic tonight is the design of this new book. And I think it's probably worthwhile saying at the outset that uh, design of Lumiere Press is not some discrete module in the bookmaking process. It's not something I do at a uh, drafting table or a Macintosh computer. It's embedded in the entire process of bookmaking from beginning to end. So the story of the design is really the story of every aspect of making the book. The great photographer Aaron Siskin once said to me, to find out what comes out of something, we have to find out what went into it. So this is the story of what went into this book. And some of my anecdotes might sound marginal or tangential, but they're all germane to the making of this project. The project in question is on the work of the acclaimed American photographer, Paul Caponegro. He's a very important figure in art, and this is probably his most famous image. It is entitled, I want to get this right because it's entitled Running White Deer, Wicklow, Ireland, 1967. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're looking for a picture of Irish deer and you go to a picture archive and you go through their index file and you come up with this title, White Deer, Ireland, you, th you probably think you hit the jackpot. And then they bring this out. Well, it's not a documentation of deer. It's not zoological. It doesn't tell you anything at all about Irish deer. What is it? Well, it's um, ethereal. It's mysterious. It's a metaphysical apparition. And this is characteristic of Caponegro's 50 years of work, this pursuit of the mysterious and the spiritual. This project was brought to me by the Joseph Bellows Gallery uh, in La Jolla, California. And once I'd signed on to do it, I decided the only thing to do was to go to rural Maine and visit Paul Caponegro. Fortunately, uh, a buddy of mine was driving out to Maine to visit some friends of his, and he was going to within a couple miles of my destination. So I tagged along, and after a couple days on the road, he deposited me at my destination, the Navigator Motor Inn. <laughs> I think it was a slow week, because when I signed in, the fellow at the desk said that the management I wanted to give me a complimentary upgrade <laughs> to a room with an ocean view. <laughs> I think their heart was in the right place, but it was sort of a dubious bonus. <laughs> However, I did like the room and it had these little marine paintings, so it was okay. The next morning, bright and early, I went out and I caught up with Paul Caponegro. And we spent the entire day talking. We we talked morning, noon, and night. And this is what I wrote in the book about that day. Paul Caponegro assured me, as he settled into his chair and lit a candle, that smoking helped him think. I took this to be simply a reflexive statement appended to a lifelong habit, but as the smoke moved in the rafters, I could see it was true. I had traveled to his home in Maine in August 2006 for a two-day visit. 
Everyone I met in the town of Cushing informed me that I had arrived at the perfect moment. The heat had broken and the bugs were gone for the season. Both of these factors were worth noting because Cabinegro's home, a beautifully crafted, steep-roofed cottage, was in the wooded seclusion of Prior Lane. The house had been built to Cabinegro's specifications to provide space for a large format darkroom, print finishing, and ample storage. For the interview, we set up, the, we set up in the high-ceilinged main room, which was spacious enough to comfortably accommodate a grand piano and had been fitted with so many windows I could follow the entire transit of the afternoon sun. The fireplace, a masonry configuration and seeming homage to the sacred stones he'd photographed in the British Isles, was formed from locally quarried rock. On shelves and tabletops, a menagerie of miscellaneous shells and pebbles evinced the gatherings of a thousand walks. The house in every way paid tribute to nature, and the aesthetics and materials of the region. Cap Negro answered the questions I put to him without hesitation or haste. The cerebral engine of smoking set the rhythm of our conversation. Each question was absorbed with an inhalation, pondered, and then answered with an exhalation. <laughs> he reflected on his life and work in reveries that were candid, articulate, and fully formed. His voice deep and resonant, mellowed not only by the vaporous adulterance, but also, it seemed to me, by a contemplative temperament that infused his spirit. The next day when I showed up at his house, he was totally exhausted. I had talked to, to him straight for like nine hours, and he couldn't take any more. So he took a long nap, and this actually turned out to be fine, because I went down to his vault and I took the time to look through his photographs. So whenever I found anything that I thought related to the conversation we had, I simply held it at arm's length and took a picture of it with my uh, little digital camera. So these are some of the pictures I discovered on that day. Keep these in mind. Uh, there'll be a quiz at the end. One of the things I really liked was his signature. And it put me in mind of something that the photographer Paul Strand had said about handwriting having a drawing quality. And I thought it was really interesting because that implies the design potential of the signature. The next day, Ron picked me up. Is every time I press the button, it's going to do that? Okay. The next day, Ron picked me up and we hit the road and went back to Toronto. This is the first design artifact uh, on this project. I had, it's a little uh, washed out, but I had an old press sheet kicking around the shop. And years ago, I picked it up one day and I trimmed it down to a size that I thought was interesting. And I wrote on the back, use this format one of these days. And it laid around the shop for years. And then when I came back from visiting Captain Negro, I picked it up again. I liked the feel of it. I felt that the format was harmonious with the verticals of Captain Negro's work. So I thought, that's it, I've got the format of the book. And then I made this little scribble down the middle, which is to signify one of the photographs I've been looking at. And in fact, that became the funnest piece of the book. And I think this is, to some extent, a validation of Allen Ginsberg's idea, first thought, best thought. I torture so many of the details in the making of these books, but every once in a while you get an artifact like this and you can see that it is preserved throughout the whole project. 